since this is uh, supposed to be an educational series, I decided to go really back to the roots and um, talk about paramagnetic metal ion polarizing agents for TNP, but really specifically focus on the uh, metal ion properties, so the paramagnetic properties of these metal ions and not so much about real applications and research. Um, I think there will be a opportunity in three weeks from now in the kind of uh, in the sister meeting, uh, the, the MIT Sumina on October 20th, uh, which I was just invited to. So you can stay tuned there uh, if you want to see more about our research. So I'm sorry. Yeah. So I will talk. Uh, and focus mainly on magic angle spinning DNP. Um, so all the properties and parameters I will introduce, they uh, will, will focus on magic angle spinning DNP. So operation at about 100 Kelvin or slightly lower uh, under MAS and a moderate to high magnetic field. Uh, so I'll not talk about the solution DNP. I will I might talk a little bit about why these metal ions might not work so much for the solution DNP, but uh, yeah, I will limit it to magic and spinning DNP. Um, and many of you have already seen uh, such a slide, and here you can see different polarizing agents which can be used in magic and spinning DNP. For example, uh, here we have the typical uh, biradical bisnitroxide totapole, which is highly effective polarizing agent for cross-effect DNP. Uh, here we have uh, typical representatives for um, radical polarizing agents, so carbon-based radicals, uh, BDPA or trital radical. They give a very narrow EPR line and have been optimized for this. But here we also have metal ions and we have introduced these metal ions as polarizing agents for high field magic angle spinning DNP a couple of years ago. And if we compare the EPR spectra of those, uh, they kind of differ in some respect, but they're also very similar. And they are similar because they all occur in a uh, rather narrow magnetic field range. So these are all paramagnetic, paramagnetic species which have an EPR resonance close to that of the free electron. And that is an important factor. And this I will introduce today why that is and in which cases this might deviate and uh, in or which metal ions we can use and which uh, might not work. Now, we, um, if we want to use these metal ions or polarizing agents in general as polarizing or as, as, uh, for, for DNP, then we have to excite EPR transitions. And this is all really I want to talk about DNP mechanisms for now is so that we just we have to operate on the EPR transitions in order to trigger a DNP uh, polarization transfer to a nucleus. And so you can see here, if we now look, for example, at totapole and gadolinium dota, for example, they have quite different uh, field profiles. So that means the DNP enhancement factor as a function of the external magnetic field, um, which already tells us that they operate in slightly different uh, mechanisms, so the cross effect and solid effect. Um, I will come to this a little bit at the end of my talk in the second uh, part. Um, but for now, just keep in mind that we somehow have to, hit, hit, to be able to hit the, the EPR resonance. So now the um, periodic table of elements has a lot of metal uh, ions or metals in general. So about three out of four elements of the periodic table are metals, but most are at least currently incompatible with high field DNP. And over the course of the next probably 20, 25 minutes, I will also explain you why. Um, but we have been able to manage to at least operate with four different metal ions, which give rather efficient uh, DNP enhancements. And those are manganese two plus, gallium three plus, chromium three plus, and iron three plus. And they have one thing in common. They all have a half-filled electron subshell. And this is pretty uh, obvious for the uh, manganese, gadolinium, and iron, which really have a half-filled uh, D or F shell, so D5 or F7 system. 
Um, with chromium, we have a D3 system in uh, octahedral ligand fields. This also gives a non-degenerate ground state, and this is what I will explain today why these metal ions work so well for DNP and others. Uh, currently, we have uh, no control so much about those right now, at least with the current instrumentation. So, uh, in my research talks, I always just tell these have quenched spin orbit coupling and therefore negligible chi anisotropy. However, they have considerable uh, zero field splitting, but due to their half integer spin nature, we can operate on the narrow center transition. So, I always just go over this in just these couple of sentences, but never really explain why and how uh, or why this is important and how this results in the efficient DNP properties. So today I will talk about these topics. And first I will start with the G and isotropy and how the orbital momentum and spin orbit coupling introduced G and isotropy to paramagnetic metal ions. And now we go back, this is what I already mentioned, we have to take a short crash course again uh, on the quantum mechanics of the hydrogen atom. And here you can see uh, the nucleus, so this would be just a proton for a hydrogen atom or a uh, high, higher charge nucleus for a hydrogen-like atom. Um, here we have an electron, just a single electron in this two particle system, and they are separated by a distance r. And in this uh, spherical coordinate system, uh, we have the angle theta, which defines the angle to the c-axis, and the angle phi, which defines the projection practically of this vector on the xy plane. And then we can use the Schrodinger uh, equation. Um, to solve the system, and you all know uh, the Hamiltonian, the general uh, formulation of the Hamiltonian, part of the kinetic energy um, given by the uh, Laplace operator here, and mu is the, the uh, reduced mass of the electron nuclear system, so it's pretty much uh, the same as the mass of the electron alone, uh, and we have the potential energy operator. And the potential energy operator is just given by the Coulomb energy. And the Coulomb energy is inversely proportional to the distance uh, between the electron and the nucleus. So now uh, we can also define here the electron nuclear distance, uh, just pretty straightforward. And we can now, um, we, we can factorize the wave function of the electron into a radial and a, an angular dependent part. Um, and we can do this, and now this might go a little bit fast, but uh, bear with me, and this is pretty the, the uh, fundamentals of quantum mechanics. Um, if we apply our, our Hamilton operator, our Hamiltonian, on this, uh, of this wave function, which is the wave function of the electron in position space without spin for now, uh, we can see that we can actually rearrange the Schrodinger equation so that we have one part of the Schrodinger equation which only acts uh, on the radial wave function and one part which only acts on the angular dependent wave function. And here uh, we can see the uh, this differential equation, the Legendre differential equation, which actually has as solution the um, Legendre polynomials. And these are the spherical harmonics, which I will show you in a minute. And you can see that here we can then uh, introduce the eigenfunctions of these uh, spherical harmonic functions. And we can solve for the radial part, but we won't do this for now. I will come back here to this differential equation practically, because this gives us in the solutions, the spherical harmonic, harmonic functions. And you all know, for example, here, the three cosine squared theta minus one term, uh, which also appears in the dipolar interaction between two spins, for example, um, but has many, many more other functions also. Um, this is the shape of the spherical harmonics. So here, 
we have a really a, a, a just a spherical function, which is a constant practically, as has no uh, dependence on the on the angular part. Uh, and here we then introduce the L, the orbital momentum quantum number, which is the first index, and the magnetic. Uh, orbital momentum uh, quantum number, the ML, which is the second index, and we can go practically down, incre increasing the L uh, quantum number, and we can go here to the right, increasing the ML quantum number as, until it uh, practically matches the L. And again, uh, this is based on the Legendre polynomials, and here this is, for example, the second Legendre po polynomials, which has this important uh, role also in the dipolar interaction of two spins. Now we can look here at, uh, for example, the orbital angular momentum operator. This is the total orbital angular momentum operator, also the square of this uh, operator. And this is practically nothing else as the Lechandre and again. So if we apply practically the square of the total angular momentum operator to any spherical harmonic functions, uh, we uh, reach here practically these eigen, eigenvalues, L times L plus one times H bar squared. That means we can di directly derive the total angular momentum from this, uh, which is the square root of L times uh, L plus one times H bar. We can also uh, look at the C project projection of the angular momentum or the orbital angular momentum. This should be the total orbital angular momentum to avoid any confusion here. Um, so the LC operator is just the uh, partial de uh, derivative for angle phi, which is quickly the rotation around the C axis. And this gives us the eigenvalue h bar ml. Um, and this is all we also know from the spin. For example, we arrive at these kind of cones where the x and y component of the orbital angular momentum is completely undefined uh, to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and the c component is quantized in space. And this is also due to the uh, commutation properties of the LC and uh, L operator or L squared operator. Um, yeah, so now we have different um, quantum numbers, L equals one, L equals two, for example, which practically give us the P and the D orbitals. Uh, and we have different orientation of our angular momentum vector um, with respect to uh, a unique axis, the C axis. And this is practically the same we know from the spin. So what we do is we just take what we already know for, for the spin. We can take this also and describe it here with the orbital angular momentum, but we can also define this or describe this in position space. So we know the motion of the electron, at least on the quantum mechanical level. Now we have a spin and I won't describe the spin here because I think we all are familiar with the fundamental quantum mechanical particles uh, properties of the spin. So let's talk about spin orbit coupling because if we have a spin and if we have an orbital uh, momentum of one electron, uh, both kind of generate in uh, their own magnetic field. And though it's easy or intuitive to imagine that they can interact by coupling to each other's internal magnetic fields practically. So if we now assume that an electron in a classical picture orbits around a nucleus on a ring, uh, this will generate a uh, induced magnetic field by this circular motion of a charge on a ring. Uh, however, we have to describe this relativistically. That means uh, we have to look at this under the perspective of the electron. That means we have to transform our frame from the static kind of um, frame of the, of the, of the uh, center of mass or the center of gravity of the electron nuclear uh, system, which is under the Born-Oppenheimer approximation practically at the same position of the, of the nucleus. But we now have to put ourselves practically on the electron and 
orbit with it around the nucleus, which puts us into an accelerated frame of the electron. And that is why this is an, a so-called relativistic effect, uh, because we have to evoke an, a Lorentz transformation into this accelerated frame. And under this, we can, at least in, in, uh, in a classical picture, uh, we can describe the uh, spin orbit coupling as L times S operator, so the, um, the vector operator of the orbital angular momentum uh, multiplied with the spin operator, the spin vector operator. And here we have lambda, which is the spin orbit coupling constant. And the spin orbit coupling constant, uh, the important part is here that this is proportional to the charge of the nucleus. For hydrogen, that would be one um, elementary charge. But for a, any hydrogen-like um, atom, this can even be higher. And this expectation value of the inverse cubed distance uh, between the electron and the nucleus. And this causes, under no uh, external magnetic field, practically a, a strong coupling between the orbital and the spin momentum. And we can describe this as a vector addition, practically, of L and S, um, of the vectors L and S. And we arrive at a resulting uh, J vector, where J is the total angular momentum. So the total angular momentum uh, comprised of orbital and spin angular momentum. And this does not have to be uh, parallel. So we always have to assume here that we have to take a vector, pro, uh, vector addition. Um, OK, now if we look at a hydrogen-like atom, we can also define or calculate practically the expectation value of this inverse cubic electron nuclear distance. And we see here that this is proportional to C cubed, so the charge of the nuclear, nucleus cubed and uh, inverse proportional to n, which is the, um, the main uh, quantum number. So practically the, the periodic number of the atom we are looking at. And this gives us a total proportionality of the spin orbit coupling constant, which is proportional to c to the power of 4, so the charge of the nucleus to the power of 4, divided by n cubed. And this z, of course, increases much, much faster than n increases if we go down the periodic table. So that means the spin orbit coupling constant is more or less negligible for light atoms, like hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, everything which is practically on the second uh, periodic row. Um, but it becomes significant and even at some point dominant if we go down the periodic table, table in the, into the transition ions and uh, even more if we go into the lanthanides, for example. So we have to keep this also in mind. So now um, it becomes even more complicated because now we also have a magnetic field. Now we just talked about spin uh, momentum and angular or orbital momentum coupling to each other, and now everything can also couple to an external magnetic field. So we now have to um, consider different cases. Uh, the first case, and this is practically the simplest case, is uh, the so-called passion buck limit, where uh, the spin orbit coupling is just a perturbation, and the orbital angular momentum and the spin angular momentum are very well conserved quantities. So neither orbital momentum nor spin momentum are destroyed or interconverted into each other, but they are always conserved. And then we have the Seaman uh, Hamiltonian, uh, which consists here of an, of an angular uh, contribution and a spin contribution. And the spin contribution also scales with the electronic G factor, the G factor of the free electron. And this is completely isotropic. Um, so this true Seemann effect, uh, where only the pure spin wave functions, uh, or this operator only acts on the pure spin wave functions, is always isotropic. However, as soon as we have a spin orbit coupling, this perturbs our, uh, our wave functions, our eigenfunctions practically, of spin and orbital momentum. And uh, 
this then starts to mix the two uh, quantities together. And then we have to consider this at least in a perturbation treatment. Um, it becomes more complicated if we cannot separately treat orbital and spin momentum uh, and use or and just treat the uh, spin orbit coupling as a perturbation. If we go to the intermediate spin orbit coupling, that means spin orbit coupling is on the same order as the interaction of orbital and spin angular momentum with the external magnetic field uh, in each case, practically, respectively. Um, in this case, we first we can still uh, create a uh, total orbital momentum because we have all the electrons in our system and the total spin momentum of all the spins in our system. And then this combines to a um, total angular momentum, J. This is what I've explained in the zero field limit and on the slide earlier. Uh, and this also has to, uh, has to happen practically when uh, the spin orbit coupling is at least on the same order as the actual same energy. Uh, now, J is uh, a conserved quantity in this Russell Saunders limit and L and S are not. So um, orbital momentum can be interconverted into spin momentum and vice versa. However, the total angular mom momentum is always conserved. And in this case, we have to look at the Lande G factor. And this is given uh, by this equation, which practically just uh, adds the orbital uh, contribution and the spin contribution to a total G factor. And then there's also the very strong spin orbit coupling, practically where the spin orbit coupling is much stronger than the interactions with the external magnetic field. And then, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, and then we have to um, look at the so-called JJ coupling limit, where each electron practically first forms a total angular momentum. And then the total angular momentum of each uh, of yeah, each electron is then added to a uh, total angular momentum of the whole electronic system. Uh, we will not treat this. This is very complicated. Um, and this is also a limit. The Russell Saunders is a uh, limit. In reality, you're always somewhere in between. Um, but let's go back to this. Um, high field limit practically where the spin orbit coupling is only in perturbation because this is the only system where we can actually uh, use in, um, in DNP in the end. Now, it would be great if we can get, just uh, get, can get rid of the orbital momentum uh, because then we had a spin only case practically and then we can have a isotropic G factor close to or even exactly at the electronic uh, free electron G factor 2.0023 and we would have an isotropic EPR resonance and we would all be happy. Uh, how can we reach such a state or nearly reach such a state? The first um, way to get there practically is if we look at a pure S atomic state. S atomic state means uh, we have no contribution of orbital momentum because either we have uh, no uh, p electrons, for example, or no d electrons, um, only s wave functions, then we have no um, orbital momentum, or all the orbital momenta practically of all the electrons are canceling each other, because, for example, we have a, a fully filled uh, electronic subshell, or a half filled electronic subshell, subshell, which is sufficient, for example, with manganese 2 plus and gallium 3 plus, where we have a D5 system or an F7 system. And according to Hund's rule, we have to fill practically all the uh, orbitals at least, uh, or at, at first with a single electron. So we have maximum spin multiplicity and no angular momentum. And then we arrive here at these S atomic states. However, this is a rather trivial state and only a very specific, specific case. So we also have to look at other cases where we uh, can work with a nearly quenched uh, orbital angular momentum. And this is, for example, if we work in a ligand field. If we put an ion inside a ligand field, we have an additional potential 
uh, due to the ligands. And this causes a deviation from our central potential. The central potential is what we introduced with the hydrogen atom, where we have a potential which is only a function of the um, distance from the electron to the nucleus. And now we have another term which is now angular dependent because each ligand, of course, has a certain orientation around the, around the ion. Um, so this introduces here this angular dependence of the potential. And in this case, the spherical harmonics are not uh, any more rotational eigenfunctions. So now we can look at these, um, at these wave functions again, and we see that this is what we know practically from our chemistry class. Uh, we have here the px, pz, and py orbitals, and the dxy, dxc, dz squared, dyz, and dx squared minus y squared. And these are practically all linear combinations of our direct solutions of the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom. And the linear combinations are in such a way that these orbital lobes practically point towards the ligands or just in between two ligands. And with this, you can practically minimize the total energy of your electronic state. And this causes then practically a quenching of the orbital momentum because the electron cannot freely rotate um, around the c-axis, but is kind of arrested in this uh, external potential. However, of course, there are exceptions. Uh, we will never be able to completely quench the orbital angular momentum um, in such a way, because in, in uh, some cases, for example, if we uh, consider specific symmetries, for example, in linear molecules, in linear molecules, we have a cylindrical potential, and that means for example, in the constitution of such pi molecular orbitals, we still have a free rotation of the electron um, around the molecular bond between the two atoms. So here we can still have full angular momentum. Um, and we also can have angular momentum inside a uh, ligand field if we have a degenerate crown state, for example, in such a case um, where we uh, practically uh, uh, degeneracy between the dxc square uh, dx sorry the dxc orbital and the dyz orbital and if we linear combine them uh, practically we re reverse the way we have generated actually these two uh, real orbitals we will arrive again at a complex orbital which has full um, symmetry rotational symmetry around the c-axis so in such a case if we have practically one electron situated in a degenerate set of these two orbitals, uh, we have full uh, orbital momentum again. Okay, but let's not talk about these exceptions because we want to arrive at a mostly um, state where we have no orbital momentum. So now we assume that we have a non-degenerate crown state with a fully quenched orbital momentum. It's practically some a uh, strong ligand field or an ion sitting inside a strong ligand field and no degeneracy. So we have uh, no orbital momentum in this ground state. And with this, we could describe our system as a product practically of the, uh, of the space wave function of the electron psi and the spin wave function alpha. This would be the alpha state. Um, and psi zero would be the uh, electronic ground state. But now higher, there are always higher electronic states. And if they can be, or if they are accessible because their energy is rather low above the ground state, then they are mixed in. And we have a mixed basis set practically. And this depends on the excitation energy. And then we have to make here a linear combination. Practically we have to mix in um, a, an excited electronic uh, wave function, psi n, which is the nth electronic state, practically the nth, nth excited state. And here we have the difference of the energy uh, above the, the ground state of this excited state. And you can also see that we not only mix in the alpha spin state, but also the beta spin state. So this causes a mixing of the two spin states in uh, this new basis set. And this is just caused by spin orbit coupling because here you can see the spin orbit coupling uh, constant again. 
now we have to move from this um, Hamiltonian, the Seyman Hamiltonian, into an effective Seyman Hamiltonian, and this is what you always see in textbooks. So when you start with EPR, um, and it's called EPR, not ESR in this case, because it's not only acting on the spin, but also on the orbital angular momentum, so on the full uh, paramagnetic moment, practically, of the electron. This is always an effective Hamiltonian with an effective spin operator. And this spin operator acts on this mixed basis as the um, as the spin operator would practically uh, operate on the alpha state or on the beta state in the spin wave function. Um, however, this operates practically on the already mixed states between orbital and spin momentum. And even if we only have a small perturbation practically and a small admixture of these higher uh, excited electronic states, we are very sensitive to this uh, because we can see here, if we have a large spin orbit coupling constant, uh, we will see uh, a large deviation practically of our electronic G factor, which has an additional component of this uh, spin orbit coupling. And here you can see these elements. And again, if these energies are rather small, the excitation energy of the excited electronic state, then uh, we also have a large uh, deviation, and this also acts on the isotropic G factor, and this is why we sometimes have quite strong deviations of the isotropic G factor in transition metal ions. And for example, if you want to look at the excitation energies of certain ions inside ligand fields, you can look at the tanabe sugano diagrams for different uh, electronic states, for example, D5 configuration. And then you can look at the ligand field, um, the strength of the ligand field, and you can then define practically the excitation energy of these higher excited states. All right, you can also apply this to radicals, for example, to nitroxides. Uh, and this also explains why the tempo radical, for example, has a deviation from the free electron G factor, which would be 2.0023. Um, and the largest deviation you can see here in the GXX um, direction. And you can model this particularly with a simple theory where you take practically the, um, this kind of rotation or the excitation, let's put it like this, you take, you excite one non-binding electron practically from the, from the lone pairs in the oxygen and you excite them into the pi star orbital, so the anti-bonding orbital of uh, the nitroxide. Um, and then you create an, a degenerate crons, a degenerate excited state, sorry, because here these two lone pairs are degenerate and this means uh, you have an orbital momentum in this state. And this then causes here deviation of the G factor uh, in nitroxides. This is very quickly abridged, but this is uh, the whole idea behind this. Uh, now for a couple of minutes, Let's talk about zero field splitting. Uh, and then we have a short break. So the zero field interaction is the dipolar interaction of a many electron system with a non-spherical charge distribution. Um, that means if we look at a quadrupolar interaction, we have to make, or we, we can only observe this as the uh, symmetry group of our system is less than cubic. Uh, for example, uh, tetrahedral or, or the rhombic, uh, and then we can observe a quadrupolar interaction, or right? the quadrupolar contribution of the zero field interaction must be like this. Uh, but there may, might be also higher multipolar moments in even cubic environments, but uh, these are usually not observed so much in most systems. Um, so here you can see the Hamiltonian of the zero field splitting, and in its uh, own eigen frame practically, this is then the um, contribution of the different uh, projection operators. So the zero field interaction uh, lifts the degeneracy of the spin system practically at zero magnetic field. And this causes then a splitting at higher magnetic fields into uh, 
several transitions. Um, so if, we, if you have a doublet system, then you have two transition. Sorry, if you have a doublet system, then you have uh, one transition. A triplet, you have two transitions. In a quartet, you have three transitions and so on. Um, and these are symmetrically split, at least in the high field limit, uh, around the uh, isotropic G factor in this case. Um, if you just take first order perturbation theory, then this is the equation with which you can uh, calculate the energy shift due to these uh, zero field splitting. And you have the D and E parameters here. Uh, and you find those here again. Then you have the angular component. You see here the three cosine squared theta minus one term again. Um, and if you forget about this E term for now, then you get practically paid patterns uh, in your spectrum. Uh, and here you see that the shift is proportional to the ms squared. That means you always get um, equal shifts practically of ms states with the same magnitude but different sign. For example, the ms uh, minus and plus one half states will be shifted the same value and the ms plus and minus three halves uh, states will be shifted the same value and uh, so you get always these doublets which are shifted with respect to each other and those are called Framas doublets. Um, but very quickly, um, we have also to, to distinguish between uh, half integer states and integer states. In half integer states, we always have a doublet where we have an ms minus one half and an ms plus one half state which is connected by the log transition. Um, in so-called non grammar systems, uh, we don't have this and this might, <clears throat> or this means we always have a um, shift practically of all the transitions due to zero field interactions, whereas this is not shifted at all. So we always have one resonance, which is practically at the center of our uh, same interaction. And this becomes apparent now much better here in this diagram, where we see here at zero practically without any angular dependence, we have our central transition, which is exactly this transition here between the central gamma doublet uh, between ms minus one half and ms plus one half. And then we have the higher order transitions, or let's call that then the satellite transitions, uh, which show this kind of peak, uh, shape, peak pattern shape. Um, with different breadth, and though in the end we have this kind of yeah, circus tent, whatever shape you want to call it, um, of the different transitions. Um, one point to consider here also is that if we look at the spin polarization, so all the spin populations, um, we can have to. Well, of course, we have to consider the Boltzmann factor. And at low temperature, that means that all the populations will be kind of conden condensing here in the lowest energy state. If the thermal excitation is not sufficient to uh, completely populate practically all the states equally. And this means that if we go below a certain threshold, it's not like in the S1 half case where we always have our population in the ground state, which is practically connected to our accessible EPR transition in high spin systems, uh, we populate a satellite transition and we depopulate our central transition. So we put practically all the polarization in, for example, into here in this dark red transition, which is very broad and we cannot really access this and use that for DMP. And our central transition will be completely depopulated. And this already happens at moderate temperatures of around 20, 25 Kelvin. At typical fields of uh, 9.4 9, 9 Tesla. All right, you can see different shapes. Um, you can also see that this is what I've shown you before. If we now have an orthorhombic component, also an E, an e parameter, then uh, this becomes a little bit more complicated. In this purely orthorhombic or ideally orthorhombic case, it becomes again a little bit simpler. Uh, we also have an effect on the central transition. So this is only a magnification practically of here, the central transition. And you can see that you have a quite complex line shape here also. And this is to a second order effect. 
because a second order effect also shifts the uh, levels m s minus one half and plus one half unequally. And this is proportional to the strength of the uh, zero field splitting constant or the magnitude of the zero field splitting constant divided by the um, Seemann energy. And then in, in frozen solutions, you also have distributions of the DND parameters, uh, which have some kind of typical shapes. And these are more or less experimentally or, or by MD simulations derived. And they match pretty well. And this means you usually cannot observe these distinct features in frozen solutions, but you have a more or less smooth background practically of the satellite transition and also a much different shape of your central transition. And here you can see in a uh, practical outcome practically of the broadening due to the second order effect. Um, and you can, can compare, for example, different radicals, BDPA and triatl. In BDPA, we have uh, hyperfine interaction, unresolved hyperfine interaction to protons, which is dominating the EPR line shape. So we have no increase in our, you know, absolute line width at high magnetic field. So this stays exactly the same. In triatl, we have G anisotropy due to a mixture of uh, excited electronic states practically. Um, and this leads to an increase, of course, of this anisotropy, um, an absolute frequency scale uh, at high, higher magnetic field, uh, and also an increase in line width. And with these high spin metal ions, gadolinium and manganese, um, if you only look at the central transition, and this is what we can use for DND, uh, we see an effective narrowing of uh, this central transition due to the reduction to the contribution of the second order effect. And at this point, sorry for being a little bit long, uh, I would like to uh, make a break and would be happy to answer some questions. Great. Thanks, Bjorn. Um, all right, we have a few questions in the Q&A. Um, to start it off, we have a question from an anonymous attendee asking, is it possible to predict if the spin orbit coupling will increase or decrease the G value from the free electron G value? Yes, it's possible. Um, I cannot give you a definite answer uh, what the actual parameters are. It depends on the admixture of the excited states and uh, also the, the spin orbit coupling constant um, can have different sign. But you have to look at this from a case-to-case -case basis. All right, we have another, another uh, interesting question from an anonymous attendee asking, can you calculate the zero field splitting values uh, using DFT? Oh yeah, you can do this. Um, I'm also not an expert on this, but it's definitely possible. And practically what you need is you need the uh, distribution of the electron density um, and from this, you can practically then uh, calculate the, the zero field splitting of the unpaired electron density, of course. Um, we had uh, an attendee talk about um, other metal complexes that can be used as, B as DNP polarizing agents, specifically vanadium complexes, um, Marat in the discussion. Uh, so can you can you comment on what other um, metal metallic paramagnetic centers have been explored or can be explored? This will come a little bit in the second part, um, but not in too much uh, depth. There is the vanadium complex. There's also one uh, recent article from from Song Vihan, for example, uh, where they have used vanadium complexes in order to actually take a look at the distance over which DNP can, can uh, transfer polarization. Um, there are certain other complexes which have also been used at low field. I will talk a little bit about this, um, cerium and neodymium, some other metals, uh, and then I will also talk about chromium and iron. Great. Uh, question from Rajat. 
uh, why would there be no coupling between the different wave functions to first order when there are off diagonal operators in the zero field splitting Hamiltonian? Uh, different wave functions to first order. Okay, this now is in really uh, in the zero field splitting Hamilton. Okay, yes, there is of course a uh, coupling between the different um, different spin uh, states. Um, I have neglected this for for the moment um, because I want to focus on the high high field case where usually in these in these cases where we are uh, operating the zero field splitting constant is rather small with respect to the Zeeman energy and then we can in most cases neglect the actual mixing by zero field splitting. But you, of course you are right, you have to consider this if you go into the intermediate re uh, regime, you, you have to uh, account for this. All right, we have a question from Amrit. Uh, why are low spin metals not used for DNP? Metals with spin a half will not have satellite transitions. So uh, if only the central transition is used typically in these high spin systems for DNP, what about low spin metal systems? Yes, um, the reason is mostly that in these low spin uh, systems with uh, SP1 half, you have uh, only one electron sitting inside your electronic system occupying practically the whole molecular orbitals. And this means that typically the excitation energies of this single electron is rather small into higher states and the these, uh, energy separation to higher states is rather uh, small. And then you have a significant admixture of these excited electronic states, which causes a typically rather large um, G anisotropy. For example, if you look at copper, Copper 2 plus, you have a typical G anisotropy between 2.04 or something like that, or 2.1 to 2.4. Uh, this is like a 20% G anisotropy, and you usually don't even have any resonance at G equals 2 if you, if you neglect a broadening or so at high field. Um, and then you cannot sweep to this resonance. Uh, cobalt uh, similar, um, cobalt uh, low spin cobalt 2 plus uh, is also spin 1 half and has a um, sort of be typically between 1.8 or 1.9 and I think 2. Point, up to 2.7 I think. Uh, there's a very large uh, g anisotropy, very large in relative terms. Uh, of course if you look at lanthanides for example this is much much larger. Um, and I will show, in the, I think on the very next slide, I will show a couple of examples of these uh, lanthanides. Uh, cerium, for example, cerium is also a spin one half system where you can have G factors uh, which kind of approach zero or even infinity. Then there's another question, what are other D and F configurations of metals that would demonstrate G value close to GE? For example, chromium, I will also show this in a moment. Um, for example, in the D3 system, in principle, every time you have um, a non-degenerate ground state, that means you cannot put the electron by choice practically in one or the other uh, orbital, uh, but you have a, a energy uh, difference between the orbitals, for example, if you have put a single electron there. Um, every time, for example, if you have a T2G system, so three uh, degenerate orbitals in an octahedral ligand field and you only put one electron in there, you, it's already uh, degenerate because you can kind of choose in which orbital you want to put it and this in immediately introduce the, the orbital momentum. Great, thank you. Well, thank you for a, a very thorough uh, and in-depth treatment uh, in this first part of the talk. I think uh, we should move on to the second part of your talk. Uh, just to let everybody know, we'll be continuing here a little uh, past the hour and we'll have some more questions at the end. Um, this video, of course, will be available on YouTube uh, later this week. So uh, just to let everybody know. All right. All right, so um, in this part, I will very quickly go over a couple of examples 
uh, of paramagnetic metal ions as polarizing agents. And I will give you one uh, slide, practically where I read you a little bit in the very early uh, days of DNP, for example, um, there were actually a couple of, of uh, metal ions utilized as polarizing agents, for example, neodymium. Uh, and this was doped into LMN. LMN is a lanthanum magnesium uh, nitrate. Uh, and it's a high, and it's very high symmetry. Uh, and it also forms very nice crystals. And if you look at this neodymium, you see it has a 4F3 electronic uh, structure and so uh, therefore a quartet electronic uh, quartet spin system with an L equals six orbital momentum and a total angular momentum quantum number of nine half. And here you can see the, the G factor or the G matrix practically can take values between 2.16 and 3.65 dependent on the, on, on the orientation. And you see immediately that uh, the free electron G factor 2.0023 is not even within the range of this uh, G tensor. So there's no way with an NMR magnet at high field that you can actually hit any resonance without completely sweeping uh, this magnet with a completely off practically field. Um, the way this was done, in fact, was with a single crystal. So with a single crystal, you can orient the crystal in such a way that you ideally can hit practically a very narrow resonance because all the uh, ions are oriented in the same way and you don't have any disorder in this crystal or at least no significant disorder. Um, here's a table of, uh, which has been published in another work by Abraham uh, and co-workers. And here, for example, you see cerium 3 plus, you see also chromium 3 plus and iron 3 plus, and also F centers. And here just uh, dangling bonds practically. Um, and they have all been, been utilized as polarizing agents in DNP at low field. Uh, for example, if you look at the cerium, and this is now a case where we can have uh, yeah, tremendous ranges of our, of our effective G factor uh, between zero practically and 1.8 in, in one system. Um, and then in other systems, it actually depends on which the, the uh, which Kramer doublet practically in this, of this total angular momentum the ground state is. Uh, you can here have then very different uh, G, effective G, G tensors in the end. Uh, and this is practically just to demonstrate you how complicated uh, the systems become if you have significant orbital momentum uh, in, the, in the ions. Uh, now coming back to these uh, examples, um, I've shown you manganese, gallium, chromium, and iron, and these are all high spin metal ions. And they're all high spin metal ions with half filled electronic subshells, or in the case of chromium, it's a half filled uh, T2G shell practically uh, in, in, a, um, in a strong ligand field. And in this case, we can practically reduce our system, and this is the beauty of it, to a central transition, which is occurring mostly uh, centered around the uh, free electron G factor. So in case of gadolinium, it's about 1.98. In case of manganese, it's pretty much 2.0. Um, I think chromium is about 1.9. And I think gadolinium is 1.99, and chromium is about 1.98. Um, so it's, it's Usually you can, you can reach those with a sweepable uh, NMR magnet. And this was the introduction uh, we made in, when we utilized gadolinium, uh, first time at high field DNP. And here we could already see that not only we could achieve quite reasonable DNP, DNP enhancement factors of 13, which is probably nothing compared to 400 or something like that. You can, you can get now with highly tailored bis uh, radical or bis nitroxides. Um, but for specialized applications, this is now opening a whole new market practically. Um, we can also see that depending on their zero field splitting, DOTA has a much, much smaller zero field splitting as compared to DTPA. You can see this here on the breadth practically of the EPR spectra. So DOTA gives a much, much more narrow uh, central transition compared to DTPA. 
And this is also reflected pretty one-to-one -one in the DNP field profiles. Um, we can also utilize uh, gadolinium DOTA, for example, to uh, hypercorrect directly carbon or also nitrogen. I can show you in this, uh, one of the following slides. And here we can achieve much, much larger enhancement factors of about 100. And with nitrogen, we have achieved something like 400, which we uh, assume is difficult then to measure the off signal, actually. Um, you can design practically uh, complexes or ligands with um, higher symmetry. And if you do this, you get actually a, a boosted uh, gain of the enhancement because uh, I've already mentioned that the second order effect scales as the square of the zero field splitting constant. So if you reduce your zero field splitting constant by about a factor of 1.4, you get a twofold increase in DMP enhancement. This has been shown by uh, group around, around Emsley recently. Uh, you can use manganese. With manganese, you get a splitting practically of your EPR resonance of your central transition into six lines due to the hyperfine coupling of uh, the manganese 55 nucleus, um, which is a five half nuclear spin. But fortunately, this is also mostly isotropic due to the S character of the, of the electron spin. Uh, but you have to live with these six intercalated um, field profiles practically of DMP, which reduces the final uh, efficiency. Um, this is chromium. This is a chromium uh, complex, which is embedded or doped into practically a, a mixed crystal of uh, cobalt, tris, ethylene diamine, uh, uh, tri trichloride in sodium chloride, hydrate, hexahydrate. Um, so in this case, uh, chromium-3 has a 3D3 electronic structure, which gives a quartet spin and a 4A2G uh, ground state, a symmetry uh, adapted uh, term symbol, 4A2G, and this just shows practically that the three electrons are occupying uh, the three T2G orbitals of the D system practically uh, with maximum multiplicity. So this gives us a non-degenerate crown state and due to the significant um, ligand field, the excitation energy into an excited state is rather large. Um, so we have a more or less isotropic G factor. However, we have a small, this, uh, small deviation practically of uh, octahedral symmetry into a trigonal distortion. And this introduces some zero field splitting because zero field splitting is really sensitive. Even without strong spin orbit coupling, we have this kind of sensor uh, of local symmetry given by the zero field splitting in these high spin systems. You can see the 140 gigahertz and the 9.7 gigahertz. So this is typical X band. Uh, this is uh, five Tesla. And you can see the influence practically of the external magnetic field on the second order zero field splitting. So here we have a rather large second order effect of our central transition. And this is greatly reduced if we go to higher magnetic field. And so at high magnetic field, we are actually not limited by this uh, second order effect, but for example, due to the hyperfine interaction to the chromium-53 nucleus, uh, where we can actually see here the hyperfine satellites of this uh, quartet nuclear spin. Um, and you see nice, uh, actually more or less resolved satellite transitions also. Uh, from this, you can determine the zero field splitting constant, um, which is rather actually symmetric. Using this, you can not only hyperpolarize carbons in the, for example, in the ligands, in the organic ligands, but you can also hyperpolarize directly the 59 cobalt, which is situating practically on the neighboring complexes the chromium has been doped into. Um, and this is quite interesting because they are at least about eight angstrom away. So this is pretty direct proof that we can transfer polarization at least over a distance of eight angstroms, uh, if not even larger. 
Um, yeah. All right, and here we've already, sorry, uh, here we've already seen that there might be also a cross effect um, at work, not only the solid effect, but also cross effect, which was kind of unusual because we thought, okay, uh, they are so far away that usually these uh, cobalt, uh, these chromiums don't see each other and cannot really talk to each other. And because uh, they are sit sitting in a polycrystalline sample, so the orientations usually of neighboring chromiums would be rather similar. Um, but we could confirm this also in another study looking at gadolinium in frozen solution where we saw quite nicely for N15, for example, that at higher concentration, there was a clear deviation from solid effect and uh, significant, significant contribution also by cross effect. And this is because in the frozen solution, the metal ions or the, the, the complexes can come to closer together just by statistics um, at higher concentrations, of course. And this is just a show off slide practically. If you want to look into this, if you're interested in how cross effect works, I will not talk about these details today because this would clearly uh, put us uh, way above uh, it, it over time. Um, but the zero field splitting due to the strong angular dependence, we arrive at a similar situations as in the um, G anisotropy broadened nitroxides. And we can practically, re or this results in these level anti-crossings which are required for cross effect under MAS the same way um, this is also achieved in nitroxides by utilizing the different orientations of the G tensors practically in the, in the, in the pair. And especially this seems to work pretty well for, for low gamma nuclei because then we can actually match two complexes with each other by working only on the central transitions, even though they are quite rather narrow. Uh, this puts a, uh, has put us into a, the idea of a direction where we thought, okay, let's kind of uh, reinvent what uh, Kanyan Hu has done uh, in 2004, where they coupled practically two nitroxides together. Uh, by this polyethylene uh, glycol linker. Um, and with this, they were able to introduce spin-spin uh, or electron-spin-electron spin couplings without having to increase the uh, concentration of the polarizing agent, but you have an inter, sorry, an intramolecular coupling. And then they could nicely show that the DNP enhancement increased um, quite nicely with the coupling between the two electrons by shorter linkers. Uh, so we pursued a similar strategy. We uh, worked together with um, Adelheid Gott from, from uh, Bielefeld University, and they are experts in, for example, in the design and synthesis of such complexes, such bis complexes. Um, and they were able to synthesize practically this whole series of different uh, complexes with tuned interspin distance. And this resulted in then also a nice series of different dipolar couplings of inter, sorry, again, intramolecular dipole couplings. And with this, we could show that there's actually a transition from solid effect at large gadolinium uh, separations to a, a, frankly, a shared contribution of solid effect and cross effect at some transitional uh, coupling. And then if we increase the coupling further, uh, the cross effect takes over and dominates the DNP mechanism. And we can also show this in N15, even though it's a little bit less um, visible here. Uh, this is an example where we have um, endogenously bound a paramagnetic metal ion, in this case manganese 2 plus, uh, to a to an RNA molecule, a hemahead ribosome. This is kind of catalytically active um, RNA strand. And with manganese, it can still function. So it almost functions at the same level as it would function with the, with the native magnesium. 
Aber Magnesium ist diamagnetic, manganese, as I've shown, is uh, DNP active, and with this, we have been able to hit practically the solid effect matching condition between the manganese and carbon-13 and enhance our NMR spectrum of carbon-13 in this RNA uh, by about eightfold. And we are also uh, able to show that the majority of the polarization of these like short um, recycling delays comes from the internally bound uh, manganese ion. This is an example from the lab of Michal Leskes, um, where I wanted to point you towards these very nice field profiles. And I know how much work uh, put into those because I have also recorded a lot of those. So this is much more work than it actually looks. Um, so, so this is one thing I wanted to point out here. Uh, but it's not only that the field profiles look really nicely, but they were also able to uh, hyperpolarize oxygen um, in these electrode materials, oxygen 17. And this just without DNP, you just don't see anything. So you can look at materials from the inside practically without having to uh, impregnate them, for example, in a polarizing agent solution. Um, there's another example, the first time that iron was uh, used in, in a similar application. Um, just one thing I wanted to point out because iron uh, has a strong tendency to um, or for, for a very large zero field splitting constants on the order of several tens of up to 100 gigahertz. Um, and so in this case, it's kind of a lucky case that the symmetry was very high and the zero field splitting constant was rather small so that uh, here a, a central transition width practically was still manageable and this was being able to be used as a polarizing agent for DNP. Um, as last example, I want to show you here how uh, we can use also gadolinium labels uh, to attach to proteins, for example, ubiquitin with uh, site-directed spin labeling. And with this, we can also hyperpolarize um, the carbons, for example, in this very early demonstration. Uh, we have now been able to improve this dramatically, but even then, uh, for example, in a uh, perduterate protein, uh, the enhancement factors are still not really convincing with about minus 10. Um, but recently we have seen that if we directly hyperpolarize N15, we can achieve polarizing, uh, sorry, enhancement factors on the order of at least 100 or even a few hundred, uh, what we think here in this case. Uh, but in this case, we have measured, I think, over the full week and uh, the off signal and still haven't seen anything. So it was not really possible to quantify the, the, the enhancement factor in this case. But we have been able to now show that uh, we can actually follow the DNP polarization as it is transferred from the electron spin to N15s directly. And with this, this is not the actual numbers that we were able to measure. This was just a teaser practically for idea that we had. The actual uh, Slide I will show a little bit later, and it was three weeks in the MIT Zoomina, uh, where I can show you that we are actually able to determine the distance over which DNP can transfer polarization. And also, we can use this to directly practically measure distances from uh, a nucleus towards the electron. All right, this I'm sorry for being a little bit long. Uh, I think I put a little bit too much time in the beginning in the quantum mechanics recap. Um, of course, uh, a lot of work has been performed by uh, my group members, first in Frankfurt, now also in, in Rostock. This is still an old picture I'm just seeing. I'm also a new one, sorry. Um, and I'm missing the newest additions to our group, Siavash and Thomas, and this is Victoria. Um, and mostly I want to uh, mention also Jörg, with the gadolinium labeling of the ubiquitin and Diana um, with the hammerhead ribozyme and Mono, she was working on the bis gadolinium complexes, for example, and also gadolinium total solutions. Um, and a lot of this was kind of kick started when I was with Bob uh, here. Um, I want to mention Andy Smith and uh, Alexander Barnes, and Vlad Michaelis, and Susanne. 
they were uh, crucial practically in the Chromium project, project, and this was also together with Enrico and I want to mention Ivano, who had the idea practically who brought us onto Berlinium, um, together with Claudio. Um, Beatrice and Mark were preparing the RNA for us, and Harald Schwalbe with Erhan and Dominic um, protein samples, and already mentioned Adelheid Gott and Ian P for the Biscalin complexes. And I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Bjorn. Uh, that was a very thorough and very informative talk. Uh, I think we all enjoyed it very much. Um, we'll take a few more questions uh, now at the end, but just quickly, I, I'd like to announce um, that uh, our, I'd, like, I'd like to announce our next speaker in two weeks. Uh, we will have an interesting talk by Nino Wheely from ETH Zurich. We'll talk about the basics of EPR for NMR spectroscopists. So that should be very interesting if you want to hear more about EPR. Uh, and I'd also like to remind all of you to tune in next Tuesday uh, at the same time as today for uh, the excellent MIT Zuminar series. Um, and then I guess, again, in three weeks for Bjorn's talk uh, at that seminar series as well. Um, so now, uh, uh, thank you all for, for staying. And we have a few questions for Bjorn from the audience. Um, so starting it off, uh, I know this is a, a this is this this can be a question for DNP. So how does the T1E of these metal uh, half integer metal spin systems compare to uh, organic radicals, spin half organic radicals or bi radicals? Um, it's about three orders of magnitude shorter. At the same time, we have about uh, eighty two hundred Kelvin. Um, whereas uh, I think if, if, if the nitroxide is on the order of a microsecond, sorry, a millisecond, uh, the, the, the gadolinium, for example, is on the order of a microsecond, but it strongly depends on the zero field splitting constant and it's highly temperature dependent also. But it's, uh, generally speaking, it's a few orders of magnitude shorter which can be good in, in terms of that you cannot really saturate the uh, polarization, the electron polarization, and for example, in these high spin metal ions, um, for the cross effect, you want still this kind of memory of uh, the polarization between practically the saturation event from by the microwaves and the actual cross effect, effect transfer event uh, occurring in different times in space, practically in the rotational space during the MAS uh, evolution. All right. Yeah. For solid effect, you usually want short T1s, uh, but longer T2s. Great. Uh, we have a question from Ilya Kuprov. Is exchange coupling negligible in these bisgadolinium complexes? Short answer, yes. Um, there was a paper from uh, also Adelaide Gott uh, and, and Daniela Goldfarb where they looked at this and they found no significant contribution, even at the shortest distance. And I think they looked at, yeah, there was no contribution there. And it's just because the, the F orbitals, they are so much contracted uh, within the, the actual valence um, shells um, that they have negligible overlap practically with the actual um, orbitals which actually interact with the ligands. Great. Uh, we have a question from an anonymous attendee in the audience. For uh, neodymium doped LMN, could it be possible to have thermal mixing at low temperatures and high concentrations? I have no idea. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, oh. uh, it could definitely be, a, but. Definitely a tricky question. I mean, you have to consider that um, this is nadimium doped into a crystalline lattice. Um, there's natural limit practically of the actual doping concentration. At some point you will distort the lattice um, and you cannot dissolve it or something like this because then you have a, uh, you end up in an amorphous uh, distribution practically of, of orientations and then you smear the whole resonance out over a very large range, like consider, if you, I think this was about, I don't know, 
2.1 to 2.4 or something or about like the whole range practically of um, if you work at three Tesla or so with some thermal mixing, uh, your width is also three Tesla in field space in first order. All right, we have a question from Amrit, uh, another question. Uh, is there a way to determine which transition of a high spin metal system will provide the most efficient DNP without performing a full field sweep DNP profile? So up to now, we have only seen significant measurable contributions from the central tr uh, transition directly. So we've never seen any indications that directly the, the satellite transitions would be involved. So I can only tell you here that uh, up to now we can say from our experience the central transition is the only transition that will contribute to TNP. All right and maybe following up on that we have a question from Tsatsa in the audience. Uh, would having these paramagnetic metal dimers which have a half integer or sorry a half field transition um, would that have an effect on DNP and, and can you comment on that? Oh, okay, half field transition. This is also one thing I have to think about. I mean, in the with strong zero field splitting, you practically uh, can have a half field transition, um, which is normally forbidden at high field. Um, but I would have to look at the actual matrix elements and, and uh, if there is a amenable matrix element which allows also a, a nuclear spin flip. I think it should, but would be an interesting thing to, to think about. As you say, though, it, it would be a forbidden transition. It would be hard to, it, it would be, yeah, interesting to think about. I mean, in the end, you think that uh, because the zero field splitting, if you have a half field transition, that usually means that your zero field splitting has a strong contribution practically to the quantization of your electron spin. Um, so your MS is not actually a good quantum number anymore. And then it becomes a question if you can flip practically with this effective spin electron spin transition, if you can flip at the same time also nuclear spin with this. I haven't really thought about this, but it's uh, an interesting idea, definitely. Um, uh, we have another question about uh, biz metal complexes from Ilya Moroz in the in the Q and A. Uh, what about exchange coupling for di manganese complexes? Mm -hmm. mm. You would expect that the exchange coupling there would be larger because you have a definitely larger uh, spin density practically on the ligands and then you can kind of extend this practically over the molecular orbital system of the tether also to the other uh, metal. But I think we have not really looked into that and I'm not sure if uh, Daniela also has. Uh, but in principle, I mean, in the in many, many redox systems you have uh, exchange coupled manganese ions, uh, but they are of course much, much closer together. Um, but I would say it's similar to, to the nitroxides. Um, so in, in the direct or tendency it should be similar to the nitroxides. So the closer you put them together, the larger the exchange interaction also would be. Um, or you have some kind of, of uh, exchange break in between where you have uh, kind of where you break the conjugation of something like that. Great, thanks. Uh, we have a question from Yu Rao uh, asking, does solvent accessibility affect DNP enhancement when gadolinium complexes are used as polarizing agents? And then there's another related question asking about the difference between gadolinium DTPA and DOTA, and if that's related to water coordination mm -hmm. or charge. Okay, uh, it's really the solvent molecule accessibility to the, to the metal ion, which I, uh, if I understood the question correctly. Um, no, I would say no. Um, I think this question aims towards the, the uh, use or function as a relaxation agent in MRI. 
where you have to have uh, diffusion practically. A water molecule has to diffuse close to the gadolinium. It has to practically directly bond or coordinate practically with the gadolinium. Then it will be relaxed and then it can diffuse away. Um, in, in the applications I have shown, we always work in frozen solutions. That means even if, in, for example, gadolinium dota, there is one free uh, coordination site for, for solvent water, um, this should be frozen out. So it's like a static ligand. There is, there is no exchange by molecular diffusion. And so I think everything should be, as soon as nuclear spins are involved, everything is uh, through the dipolar network. Um, and then I don't think there's a, a, a difference on influence if the exchange, uh, the water is bound or not. And this was shown by, by Lynn and Emsley, where they have shown this, um, I forgot the name of the complex, but um, their complex has no free coordination site um, and it worked even better. Great, we have another question uh, following up on the half field transition question. Uh, an anonymous uh, attendee wants to know, uh, isn't a half field transition like a double quantum transition where two electrons flip? And in yes, the case of these very short, the, very the short ruler molecules, maybe dipolar or exchange coupling. Well, the half field transition is, uh, it is an internal of the, of the high spin system where two electrons flip at the same time in the strongly coupled high spin system. Um, that's pretty much the, the whole idea behind it. But uh, you can only excite this if your zero field splitting within, or the dipolar interaction, if you want to say so, within the um, high spin system has a non-diagonal contribution practically to the, to the overall Hamiltonian. Um, if it's completely commuting with the same interaction, then you would never be able to induce this. Um, this means that you have to have a certain off-axis quantization practically, of z axis quantization. So your, your, your nuclear spins have a different quantization axis as the electron spins. Um, yeah, I really have to, to think about this. I think if it's weak enough um, and you can still excite the half field transition, it could be possible. Yeah, but I have to think about this. Uh, right, and then see a last question. Should we answer last question, also? yes. Can From you predict if T1E of metal complexes increase or decrease under MAS? We have not um, looked into this. I mean, right now it's not really possible because I think no one, is there any system, I think, right now there's no system yet where, where people can uh, measure T1E of metal complexes and uh, with EPR and do MAS at least under significant uh, frequencies. I would not, assume that um, it would change so much because for the electron spin, the MAS of, I don't know, 10 kilohertz or so uh, frequency is more or less um, adiabatic change of the, of the energy levels. Um, so I think it will not have a large effect on the actual relaxation rates.